Want yeah. To call it? yeah, so it's um, fixed 40. And this is the fiber broadband completion task force January 27th uh, meeting. And I'm Mark Howell, the chairperson, and I'll call the meeting to order with a roll call. Um, I see Gordon Brockway is not present. Uh, Scott Hopkinson. Uh, present. And David Hessel is not present. Gail Heyer. Here. And myself, Mark Howell, which gives us a quorum to begin at 640. Um, David had previously indicated that he was going to be traveling and might not be able to make it. I have not heard from Gordon today. But um, I think we'll, we can proceed with, um, with a number of things. The, and uh, you know, if we need to um, cut short, that's OK. I'm aware there's a candidates forum tonight as well that some people may want to also go to. Um, so Scott volunteered before we started to be the clerk for tonight. So we don't have to have that. Um, that discussion. Um, we talked, to, we have pending minutes for January 6th and January 13th. And January 6th, I believe, are sort of being distributed as we speak. So we'll deal with those at a later minute. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm later. sorry. Uh, I thought I just sent January 13th, I think. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll say to be distributed. And we do have the 13th. Um, I, I know that there was a pretty substantial discussion on the 13th about a number of things, and I'm a little reluctant to, um, I'm a little reluctant to, to get into approving those without everybody having a chance to weigh in on that. Um, I don't know where you guys stand on that. Um, Gila, do you had a chance to look at them? I think that's the one where Scott, did I send you some edits on that one? I believe you did, yeah. Yeah, and they, they were um, maybe slightly more extensive than usual, but nothing like earth shattering, but it, it might make sense to wait. Yeah, I, okay, so which first of all, which minutes are we talking about? Just, just to make sure I'm on just, track. Uh, just January 13th, which is okay. our last meeting that was two weeks ago. Yeah, so, those are the ones. I, I, and I apologize, folks. Just, just full disclosure, I've been buried with work. I mean, I, I, today I've had ten minutes for breakfast, fifteen for lunch, and about fifteen for dinner. So, <laughs> no, no, so no, I'll, I apologize. So, so what I would say is, then I'll, I, I would say I'll take. I forgot that she had sent me those notes. I just sent out the thirteen minutes. I will absorb those notes and send it out again. Yeah. I had also sent you know something with track changes on for the 13th and it was for the most part just pretty much picking up some typos and some some you know incorrect correctly spelled incorrect words um, that I okay. found. Okay. So um, you might have two levels of that. So let's let's go with um, we'll postpone working on either of those and if you could maybe incorporate what you already have on the 13th and redistribute that scott that I, I, will, I, I will i will i will do that and i imagine you have some sort of chart that says what minutes are missing yeah i do and so basically we're up to date in terms of approval and stuff um i'm running a little bit behind on posting and gail helped me no maybe. but I, i'm looking for what i'm behind on so it's january okay. six ones you need Right. Six and 13. I think that's the last two meetings only. Everything else has been um, dealt with and approved here. If okay. you have final versions of anything that you know you finalized in the meeting and you want to send them to me, I'll, I, I have been integrating those with documents that you know are screenshots that we used and posting the, sending them off to the clerk. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. I'll, it's probably probably Saturday during the snowstorm will be a good time for me to catch up. Sounds good. Well, let's all hope our fiber is working. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so in terms of chairs reports, uh, the February meetings, which is next 
next week. So I, I guess the first first thing to deal with is um, I did attend the select boards meeting that was held right before the um, special town meeting. And Gordon was there as well. And um, at that time, the select board did agree with our appeal to um, extend the appointments and modify our charge uh, so that we could keep on meeting as a task force um, through um, June 30th. And that'll take us kind of to the end of the fiscal year. And you had all indicated that you were um, willing to continue to serve. And I know there, I think there was a matter of a vote to be taken by the select board to, um, to further on the appointments. I don't know whether they've actually done that or whether they're planning to do it on Monday, but they thought it would be done in time. So we can in fact schedule a meeting for February 3rd. Um, so there's that. And then, so I'm just checking your, your availability. That would be next Thursday, the following Thursday. Um, Carlin pointed out, thank you, Carlin, that I, I misread the town calendar. The enterprise budget hearing is actually on March 17th, which is also a Thursday. So there's no conflict with February 17th and the 24th. So does anybody have any concerns about those future meeting dates? Okay. Nope. All right. And I covered the um, appointments to uh, continue and I covered, uh, okay. And um, just for our awareness, I thought I might bring this up just briefly. The select board is having a focused meeting as we've mentioned earlier on, the, on Monday, the 31st, which is before our next meeting. And at that meeting, the intention is to um, focus on the American Recovery Plan Act funding and how to use it. Um, Can I just pause you for one second? It, it, does Scott, Scott, are you taking minutes for tonight? Oh, Do we have a clerk or? Yeah, I'm typing like crazy. Okay. Um, and the other thing, what time is that meeting on Monday? Do you know? Um, more? Let me check. I was just about to 6.30. Okay. I was thanks, Terry. I'm I'm hoping that I could um attend. Yeah. You Is know, that going to be a virtual meeting or a hybrid meeting or in person, Terry? Uh, looks like it's going to be all virtual. Okay. All right. So it should be. And we're also going to finalize um, the extension of your appointments for for your whole committee. Okay. Good. And um, just briefly, the agenda for that meeting, I think that I, I'm not sure where, I think I've hit the wrong thing. Let's see if I can go back. No, that was it. Oh, okay. I thought there was, yeah. I thought I was trying to make sure that I was just getting the one window. Um, yeah, so the, there's a consent agenda. So I guess Carol LaFleur is going to do, uh, do an overview um, the eligibility requirements and um, some preparation by areas of the town and then some of the ideas for the town manager. So I think that this is an important one for us to listen to because obviously broadband is, is interested. I've been um, researching what I can on the, um, on the way some of the interpretations of the of the Treasury Department rules on, on Recovery Act funds and, and infrastructure funds around broadband are. So I think this is a, you know, a good topic for us to weigh in on how, um, you know, what resources might be available and how we might recommend uh, addressing them in, in, our, in our discussions. And also I think understanding what deadlines there are that might occur there. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts already on this subject but I think it's a, um, an important one for us to dig into a little bit. Uh, you know, I guess my only comment about this would be, um, I, unless, I don't know if particularly what the scope of these recovery funds are, um, but this is part of the recommendation we would make on how to pay for this, right? That falls mm -hmm. into that, that broad category. 
Um, do we need to spend a lot of time on that? I mean, I'd rather I'd rather spend more time on maybe the focusing on the fiber completion part of it, and then say this is something that someone is investigate. I, you know, I, you know, let me ask the question a different way. Um, is someone in the Concord broadband entity going to think, spend time trying to figure out how to extract those dollars? Hmm. I'd like to think so. Um, I think though that taking a look at it and being prepared to potentially take a position on what the opportunities might be either in, you know, with the light board or um, to advocate with staff on what we think they, they might be able to do, certainly in the purview, especially if it turns out, and I think it does turn out that some of these, these are relatively time sensitive opportunities. I assume there are some deadlines that are probably fairly close that when one would need to begin an application process. And, and uh, you know, obviously I'd love to show up and find out that town staff had the whole thing planned out. And if they do, I'll be color me impressed. But, <laughs> okay, uh, I got it. Message, uh, got it, that's fine. Yes, Terry. Well, on the one hand, um, the staff doesn't have it all figured out, but that's a good thing too, because we want to get input from mm -hmm. citizens. And one of the things you might not have seen on that agenda, at 7.30, we're specifically asking committees to give input. Yeah. And I didn't want your committee to uh, be excluded from this discussion. I think you want to be an advocate for fiber. Mm -hmm. you have to know how much or any details. Nobody has any details uh, yet. We have until 2024 to decide what we're going to do in 2026 to spend it. But we need to get started with this dialogue. Mm -hmm. We definitely need you guys at the table um, to listen to the others and to um, advocate for what you guys want to do. And um, one more quick statement about that. If there are plans to accomplish multiple objectives, that would be the best. For example, one of the things about ARPA is if there are inequities. Um, so if someone doesn't have equal access to fiber, that's something that ARPA wants to correct. It's one of the main goals of it. So, Affordable housing would be another issue like that. So you're accomplishing being a welcoming community and providing access for fiber and DEI, well, all these different cross silo, multiple objectives mm -hmm. would be a, um, a very good way to look at it. Great. Um, Carlin. Uh, Carlin, read 83 would send. Um, is it access to fiber or access to high-speed internet, because there are two major ways of getting internet in town. You know, don't forget Comcast. They do provide internet to the coaxial cable. Now, I'm not going to advocate necessarily one or the other. I think that, though, that the broadband component should be part of, the, part of our package. And to me, it's just, all right, how much should we advocate for? I don't know, Terry, are you going to be asking for dollar amounts at Monday's meeting? No, I don't think anybody is that far along. Okay. Everybody I've talked to is, uh, you know, we, we, we need to have a forum where we can all in the community start talking, <clears throat> but nobody's got a dollar amount yet. Okay. Um, I'm Terry, uh, just to follow up on that, I thought at the last meeting you said something about there were 29 million in requests, or is that? So some okay. people do have dollar figures. Right. That number is what happened in Sudbury. Oh, OK. So that's not I'll Concord. Be, I'll be talking about that. When they have a forum, they're getting about the same amount we are, about 5 million. And the forum had so many ideas, they had 29 million. Of OK. That could be a problem. Um, let me just say one more thing. Um, in response to a question Mark had, and we'll go over all of this on Monday. 
there are several different pots. One pot is a completely separate infrastructure bill for which fiber might or internet might be included. ARPA is a separate bill and there's two parts to ARPA. One, we're getting 5.6 million. Two, we can apply for more funding under ARPA for specific projects. So there's a lot to it and we're still learning it. And this is probably the first of several meetings. Uh, let me interrupt for just a minute. I want to capture a couple numbers that Terry mentioned. The requests from Sudbury were 28 million and they received three or 5 million? 5 million. Thank you. Yeah, some of the research I've been doing and, and it is confusing and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to claim that I've got it locked in, but there, there is some fairly lively discussion in some of the, some of the broadband forums about um, mapping and the, the notion is we, you know, the, for a long time, people have been critical of the FCC's process for determining whether a particular area is served by high-speed broadband or not served by high-speed broadband. And they've used these maps that were based on census tracts. And if you use the census tract data, Concord is served. We, we have Concord Light Broadband, we have Comcast. However, it does seem that the, in the Treasury Department's re revised rulings on, I believe it's the infrastructure side, they are entertaining the idea that a municipality or an entity can essentially certify that some particular sub component, some, some subsection of an area which is served is in fact not served so or is underserved. And those are important distinctions because um, my concern has been that, that we may, by virtue of how much capability we already have, kind of not fare very well in the application process compared to other communities that literally you know, have next to nothing. But it does seem like if we can identify specific areas um, as you know, similar to what we've been doing in our mapping process that for whatever reason are not served, it, our downtown areas, our businesses, um, you know, rental housing or something like that, we might be able to define some smaller projects which, which then might fit into the criteria. So I'm still trying to learn about that, but I, I think that, that you know, at some level taking it to another level of detail is probably what is going to um, is going to lead to both projects that are of a size that might fit into the kind of funding that we that, that we could ultimately get, and things that you sort of move the needle on the criteria. So that that's my hope to get educated about that. And I had a question, um, maybe along the lines of what Carlin was getting at. Um, so right now, the town has a franchise agreement with Comcast, whereby Comcast must um, provide internet to anyone who wants it. And no, no, she's shaking her head. <laughs> I guess, no. well, let me just say what, what I'm wondering is like, if anyone can get it from Comcast, does that mean the whole town is quote served? So maybe Carlin yeah. can explain. Clarification, the franchise agreement just covers, just covers cable TV service. Now, whether that includes internet that's up to the customer and an agreement with Comcast, but the franchise agreement itself does not cover internet. Okay. So, oh, I see. So if, if a customer wanted cable TV, <clears throat> they have to, Comcast has to provide the cable TV and whether or not the customer is able to receive internet from Comcast is basically up to Comcast. Well, it's up to Comcast and the customer. For example, right. in my household, I have Comcast TV only, but I have the town broadband. Mm -hmm. I used to have Comcast internet, but I chose to drop that service once I got the town broadband. Okay. Now, okay. I Thank think you. the same signal runs over the same lines. So you can kind of make an inference, but mm -hmm. it's that obligation of the franchise agreement. That's the part that's the sticking piece from my perspective. Okay. No, that's helpful. That 
that clarifies things. And I and I wonder if well, oh, um, I mean, I guess we're not there yet, but if someday we are, maybe by 2024 or 2026, when the money has to be spent, if we have an opportunity to say, you know, we can get the whole town connected and, you know, have 100% coverage and therefore that may lead to, I don't know, some other great things that can happen, then that might be some, that maybe that meets some criteria for, I don't know, get, you know, for, for an argument for getting the money. Um, just a, a thought that I had. I'd like to take the devil's advocate position to just discuss this for a minute. Um, so we're saying, if we were looking at these funds and and asking, say, hey, we have some sub areas that are underserved. To Mark's point, we can identify an area that's underserved or not served. We need these funds to address them. And the counterpoint might be, hey, uh, Comcast has a commitment to serve every household, no matter where it is, with television. And what comes with that is broadband. You know, if I were arguing to not give you the money, give the town the money, that's the argument I would use. I'm I'm taking the adversarial view which is to say there is a solution that gets some form of broadband to every location in town. The solution is sign up for a Comcast television, add on their broadband, you're done. Um, so I, you know, I'm just pointing that out as a, as a counter argument to the approach that Mark has suggested, which I think is the one we should try, which is identify areas that are unserved or not served, isolate them, and say this is an unserved area. We want funding to, to address it. Those, so do you understand? Yeah, and I was just thinking, you know, because some of these areas might be places where people don't have a ton of extra money. Maybe you know it would be a stretch to say they can afford Comcast cable plus Comcast internet. And you know, at some point, the town might come up with a you know a, a, a low entry point. Um, so I, anyway, I just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the counterpoint to that is Internet Essentials 995. You know, <laughs> so I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, we don't need to. This could be a rat hole, so let's let's move on. Well, I think and you know, as long I mean, this is the lawyer and me speaking. As long as we have a position that is justifiable, if it, there's pos if it's possible that an individual could get Comcast cable and then um, you know tack on the the internet, that you know that's a technical way they could get it, but the fact being that that there are areas that don't have a connection, um, I, I think that's I think it would be reasonable to make that argument in this circle in this sum. Um, We're going to call on you and Carlin when it comes time to make that <laughs> argument. Okay, no problem. I'm out of my helmet. <laughs> happy to do that. I think it's a good discussion to have. Welcome, Gordon. Um, I'm, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, no worries. We were we were talking a little bit about the um, the fact that there's a meeting on Monday evening that the select board is hosting that's going to going to go through sort of the status of the American Recovery Plan Act funds and and how we might position for that. And Terry brought us up to date on it a little bit. It's more of an you know an information sharing and, and point of view meeting. Decisions apparently would be made about how to spend what the town is receiving. Um, no later than 2024, I guess, and, and the money would be spent no later than 2026. And I think based on that, I'm suggesting that we should we should plan to participate. I think we should, um, I would be willing to speak on behalf of the task force if we have a consensus about what we might want to say. I think I would just point out primarily that um, nobody should be laboring under the illusion that the, the Concord Lakes fiber network gets to everyone, that there are significant portions of the town that are not served. And, and um, you know, exactly understanding what, how that sort of interacts with these, the objectives here is, is, um, is something we need to do. But I think that it's, it's certainly worth a look to see whether there might be some appropriate investments to be made there. Um, good. And so that's kind of, uh, I'm glad we had that. Does anybody want to say any more about any of that? 
Mark, I do have some resources that you may or may not have seen about just kind of interpreting the infrastructure funding yeah. stuff. So I can I can send those to you. Yeah, I'd love it if you'd share them. Um, <clears throat> I guess I could share with everyone, right? Just send an email. Yeah, that'd be great. To everyone. Okay. Yeah, I think I had sent something earlier. You um, did. Which was also along that line, and I think that it's it's worth trying to read into this. I think at the very least, our report will need to address it, and um, and we should we should take a position on that. Uh, uh, Mark, I have a stupid point of um, open meeting law rule question. Mm -hmm. Can she send something like that to the entire committee, or does it have to go through you or blah blah blah? Um, there's no problem with sharing, you know information you know one of well, a person on the on the task force sending something to everybody else and saying here's what i found here's what i'm okay you know, here's what Got i it. did yeah make makes sense i just wanted to check kinds of things what we can't do is engage in any kind of discussion back and forth in, over email um you know, request for you know we could say i think any one of you can suggest at any time you know here's something i found that's interesting please put it on the agenda and i will happily add it to our next agenda and, and we'll got it um yeah. go you've with. answered the question i just want to make sure we didn't run afoul of it yeah so um oh and uh, just a, one other thing is it can be uh, i think it's um a, a practice to uh, if there's a document that's discussed or referenced um in the meeting that that document be attached to the minutes mm-hmm I was covering that a little bit earlier. I've, I've been engaged in some, some housekeeping, doing those attachments and creating PDF files and making sure that we're um, getting caught up with the posting of the minutes that we've already approved that actually already have those, those documents attached to them. So and, Gordon, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I thought you were about to stop. <laughs> sorry, I was, I was, I'm not one of five kids. I interrupt sometimes, slap me. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in common too um gordon what you said uh, so my question is there was a presentation made at the light board with details about the broadband planning and financials um and then you told us subsequently that we weren't we couldn't distribute those but if what you just said is correct then we should be able they should be attached to the minutes is that not i agree case? yeah okay and uh, thanks i can't i'm very I'm the I'm the clerk, and I'm and uh, but I'm waiting for it, for the minutes to be generated by staff, and then I I um, proofread them and correct them and so forth. And that process has completely stalled. Hmm. Uh, interesting. So they got town staff to do minutes. <laughs> Pretty sweet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's move on. There, there'll be an AI bot for that soon. Yeah. Um, there already is. Um, yeah. I, actually, we have somebody on the paid committee that has been promoting that. Never yeah. mind, the YouTube does transcripts automatically. I work. So the the next thing that I wanted to raise was something I think well, it's actually I guess come up in the last last couple of weeks. I had mentioned that we had gotten uh, communication through our web page. Um, this is item four on the agenda um, from uh, Mr. Rick Winters. Um, of Stacy Circle about the uh, fact that his um, his street is scheduled for uh, the roads program in 2022, and I had said I would make some inquiries about that, and I, I believe I'd mentioned to the committee that I would do that, and just as a kind of brief reminder of what this issue is. So the, the um, here's, here's what he sent um, with the details of exactly how to contact him removed um, just for privacy. That's, this is from our agenda for this evening. And um, I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. Uh, oops, that didn't, didn't do what I wanted it to. There we go. Let's try this. So this is what Stacy Circle looks like from our broadband map. 
and you can see it's a it's a cul-de-sac underneath the box that's that has its um name on it is actually where the road intersects with i guess that's old mill road and the, the off harrington lane is a really is, is almost not a road road um, but stacy circle is paved and in, in all of these premises this is one of our 52 areas that we've identified are are not served i i took a drive out there and it's there's a, an underground electric utility services there already um, you can tell by the transformers right right where my cursor is there's a transformer kind of on that on that corner. And so this is a situation where there's electric service underground and not fiber. And so so I communicated with the um, and there's a letter that goes out. The, the way he got informed about this is the the public works department sends out this this letter from you know, about their roads program annually. And on it is a table of all of the streets that are gonna be reconstructed. So I don't know whether, how well you can see that, but there's a number, there's a number of roads and Stacy Circle is one of them that are scheduled for reconstruction. There are also other treatments that, that they do which are less than rebuilding the road. Um, some of the other roads that, that are on this list are Alfred Circle, Autumn Lane, Ayrshire, Ayrshire, Ayrshire this cul-de-sac off of Mass, Matson Drive. Uh, Alfred Circle is also off of Matson Drive. Um, Matson Drive itself, which is off Williams Road and um, Old Mill Road from Harrington Avenue to um, Range Road. So. The, the interesting thing about this is, you know, the question that, that came up is what sort of coordination is being done? The, the resident is raising the question of if my road is going to be rebuilt, the letter says once it's rebuilt, there's a moratorium on digging it up for at least five years. So I was trying to ask the question of what happens to somebody in this situation how do they, um, what's, what expectation can they have forever having fiber um, installed in their, in their street? And um, I thought I would, uh, would read back that I had distributed the responses to my inquiry to you a little bit ago, but I thought I'd, I'd bring them up here and, and um, we could, to talk about this because I think that this kind of points at least one area in this in this um, system that we may want to get into. So um, Steve Ducan, who's the town engineer, responded that when streets are selected for the road program, they send out a list to all the uh, underground utilities so they can plan and perform their work ahead. Um, CMLP received a list of the streets and there and the public works department is waiting to see if the department is planning any work on the streets. Um, and they're open to adjusting the paving of the streets if there's a commitment to install fiber conduit in short order. Um, so they, and he, he mentioned Greg Marsnick who, who is on that. And he pointed out to me that I, I was incorrectly referencing the 23 road program, but this is the 22 road program where construction would start this May. Um, Dave Wood also responded um, after Steve and said that the undergrounding of electric utilities is funded by a surcharge on the electric bill, and those funds can only be used for conversion of electric overhead facilities owned by CMLP to underground facilities, and, that, and that's covered by Mass General Law. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the undergrounding program. And my observation here is that this essentially means that there is no, um, there is no funding source that's been identified for fiber. Roads that are already undergrounded um, and that lack fiber will never be qualifying for funds from the um, 
the underground surcharge that's collected on the electric bill. And therefore we've got this, this hole that says, you know, these roads could come up. Um, my understanding of reconstruction is they basically dig up everything down to the sort of base layer of the road and resurface it all, all which is seems to me to be an ideal time to put conduit underneath for electric, for, for fiber only, um, given that the electric is already underground. Um, and yet it, it doesn't seem that there's any apparent coordination. So I thought it would, uh, would be interesting for us to discuss where we might, you know, where we might respond and, and what our reaction is to this, because I do think it creates a situation for a number of, of these locations where, you know, it's hard to see when, when they ever get fiber. And I, I can say that this is like the reason that I came up with the idea of Article 41. I was so horrified by the stories of this situation. I'm like, what is a person to do? I mean, you know, it's great that they're in a neighborhood with no utility poles, but now what, you know? So I, I think um, it would be great to hear what Greg Marcinik has to say along those lines. Um, but I mean, it, there, there seems like there should be some plan for adding fiber. And I agree, this seems like the easiest place to do it. Um, seems almost like a no brainer, but I, obviously, you know, things in government don't work, <laughs> you, you know, well, I mean, insensibly all the time. Yeah, my comment to that is, um, David is constrained by the restrictions on his finances, to not use those funds for something that isn't to the benefit of the ratepayers for power. That I mean, I think that's as as I interpret all this, that's how it com it comes down to. So, you know, maybe there's an another undergrounding surcharge. Maybe it's not. I, I don't. Maybe it gets applied to the people that have the broadband. There's a one dollar surcharge for undergrounding additional broadband. That goes back to the how do we fund what we need to do. Um, that maybe that's an approach. Well, it's not like as if we asked uh, David to pay for new fiber using electric electric undergrounding funds. We didn't say that. He says we can't use that, but that wasn't what our question was. Yeah, my question was about coordination. You know, what yeah. coordination and planning is going on? And, you know, I felt like the answer was the public works department sent it to the electrical engineering department. And, you know, the, and that's, you know, that right off the bat says it kind of didn't land in the right place. It, you know, you could imagine that the broadband department might not even know that such coordination was requested. Although, you know, my, you know, my experience is that the electrical engineering department will work pretty well with broadband when they when they have the opportunity. But I could also see how they could say, well, we don't have any electric work out there, so we're done. And they, of course, they don't have any funds for it either. So that, that I think connects to our previous conversation, which is that could be a project, that, you know, there are projects that are being considered every year that should at least be checked for, for feasibility. Um, and maybe it's okay, but, you know, once you repave a road, especially with the roads program, the way it is, it can be 20 years or so before that road is repaved again. And so there's a real, you know, you missed the boat. Curious you know, that, to, that, that actually, how much, oh, go ahead. I, I, how much is this going to cost? The, the figure they always throw around is it's, um, a million dollars a mile for electrical, um, undergrounding. Um, and then, of course, David Hessel gave us um, maybe a fifth of that for the undergrounding at yeah. Concord Green. Um, Mark, how many feet do you think um, this street is? That's a good question, and I can answer it if I... And, and, and sorry for cutting you off, Scott. Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I look for that answer. So I'm, I'm guessing that uh, it's probably a couple of tenths of a mile. 
So that may be $20,000, $20, just kind of like, uh, like that's a 10th of, of the project at, yeah, you're off at by, uh, Concord you're, Green. You're off by a zero if you use that math. Oh, oh really? Two tenths Wait, of I a mile, this... two tenths of a million dollars is no, 200,000. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, that's 200,000, no, but. Um, uh, oh, the Concord Green one? Said yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, then, yeah. and yeah, and then recalling that um, <laughs> it's always good to bear in mind that those numbers that they were talking about at Concord Green were about only the, uh, the conduit piece. Not well, I, I, I would actually caution you to use the Concord Green example at all, because Concord Green has a certain amount of conduit that isn't in place. It's yeah. an incremental thing that they need to do. I, I, I actually just would not use that for any other conversation except for Concord Green, frankly. Okay. Yeah. So it would be, I mean, the thing that the million dollars a mile for power is a totally different thing than what it might take to drag a fiber optic cable buried you know, 10 inches below the ground you know back to the ditch which kind of a approach i we don't have the number we don't know here's yeah. the we 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 agree we don't know here's the the statistics that we do have um that little area i'm highlighting it now um, from our you know street status report that we looked at before is 13 units um they're all single family housing units so um it's 13 parcels and it looks like together those are 1,540 feet. So I apologize for scrolling around too much, but so some of parcels, some of feet for those road for that road is pretty straightforward. So you're talking about enough conduit to give you 13 new houses or you know connections. So if I were planning this from a fiber perspective, I might, you know, pull a 24 strand cable down there with, you know, which has, I believe four tubes of six strands each and put in a couple of splice cases. Um, and that would, you know, there's probably something that was actually planned in the network originally for this. So you don't have to guess at it, but, um, even at, you know, what what was the uh, what was the dollar figure per foot we were talking about a minute ago? Hundred. Oh gosh, I <laughs> I was doing it in miles. I can it, figure it out. Give me a second. Yeah. In the meantime, oh, okay. even if you're even if you're paying, you know, a hundred dollars a square foot, that's only fifteen thousand dollars. Maybe you know, even if you're paying, I mean, if you're paying a thousand dollars a square a square foot and, yeah. and maybe yeah. issue, but that, not, yeah. that would be way too much. Yeah. It's linear I, feet, by the way, it's not square, but that's- a, I, I'm sorry, linear, yeah, per mm -hmm. foot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually came across a report from 2018 um, that does cost estimates for fiber installation. And, um, and I haven't really dug into it, but it looks like one of these for like a metro underground area actually new underground 86,000 per mile oh that's a totally different number holy cow yeah and that includes and they get into a lot of detail there's like all the design and this splicing and the splicing so, and the this and the that so anyway we could i can send that around to folks but please, please do so let me give you let me just give you some numbers because i whipped out a spreadsheet um mm -hmm. the million dollars a mile is $189 per foot. Yeah. The $86,000 that Gail just mentioned is seven, $16.28 a foot. There's a huge difference. Yeah. Well, of course, the electrical, that, I mean, it's got these big, heavy electrical cables. Well, they also right? have to go down 48 yeah. inches or some number like that. Yeah. All that, yeah. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah. Difference. Gail, would you, you're going to re, uh, forward yeah, that report? Yeah, I, um, I can circulate that right now while we're talking about it, if that, if that makes sense. Whenever. Yeah. For people, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's like a 34-page PDF. Um, it's, 
prepared by the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition, and they just they just were doing a survey about connecting yeah. via fiber optics. So I'll, that's what I'll send around. So you, but Scott, your number was like sixteen dollars a square. Well, based on it was sixteen dollars a square foot. It's sixteen dollars a foot based on eighty six thousand dollars a mile. So I kind of doubled that and said, you know, for a small project like this at thirty dollars, yep. that would be forty six thousand dollars to do that street. And we also wait, have, wait a minute. you know, yeah, it, that's right. Okay, I just want I mentally check the math because, yeah, and um, you know, if we were going to that Madsen Drive area, which is the other one that's on the current road program, that would be. Uh, Let's see if I got this. Did I pick up that? No, I didn't. We'll look up this. Just in, you know, rough monkey math here. I call it fast math. Yeah, 197,000, call it 200,000. So for $250,000, which is a substantial amount of money, obviously, for the broadband business. You could, you know, consider doing those two groups of streets that just happen to be already scheduled for reconstruction. And of course, you know, I would say that that's, you know, that's by doubling the numbers that Gail came up with when you're already repaving the street anyway. So you're not paying to demolish the street. You're not paying to repave it because that's all happening. You're basically dig digging a trench down the street that was just torn up, putting something in it and coming back down. So it would, wouldn't have surprised me at all if it could be done for substantially less than what we're talking about. And, the, and that the one you've got up now is yeah. 39 homes total. Yeah, it looks like there's 20, 25 parcels on Matson Drive. And oh, okay. the yeah, Drive, about... which is three parcels, was not actually on this list. Uh, I used to know someone that lived there, and it's right off Matson Drive. It, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just like the, a little cul-de-sac off of it. Right. And, you know, I could see why if that wasn't actually getting repaved or reconstructed, maybe you just you get that much closer, but you don't cover that three houses. So maybe you only get 22. It's a substantial, I mean, it's a substantial expense, but it's also two of these sections that we've identified before. What was yeah, the number? So, oh, go ahead. So I guess ahead. it looks like um, Greg Marsnick has been copied on this correspondence. Does it make sense for us to reach out to him separately, mm -hmm. or I, I, I don't know. I mean, by the time yeah. our report comes out, this <laughs> paving's gonna be up, whatever. The well, if you guys would agree to it, and you think it's, I, I think that this is something that really makes sense to, to invite, um, you know, a discussion with, with staff at a meeting about the, you know, about the, at least the level of coordination and planning that is that is done for the roads program. I think the question is just like the roads program or the undergrounding fund. Obviously, if there's no financial resources available for these kinds of in, this kind of investment, it's not going to happen. But um, I think it is really useful to be able to understand. This is at least one of those paths. This is premises that are clearly not served. That are you know that were designed to be served, and yet, um, you know, the, the whole discussion about you know should they be and are they the top priority or whatever is really germane. If if the if we know the road's going to get rebuilt, I think it's worth at least looking at it and considering doing it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I agree. So I'll I'll continue. Is there anything that you would? like to suggest, I, I will plan to respond. I, I shared with both of all of you, the, the both responses that I got to, to my inquiry on that. And I think the question is, how would we like to respond to those responses? Well, I mean, right now the situation appears to be 
we've identified an opportunity and a, an inflection point, meaning the road is going to be serviced so that we should figure out how to do that. The part is, so carpe diem, how do we act and how do we fund that act? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's, we identified something near nine on $250,000. Where is that money going to come from? You know, yeah. well, wait, that's really we what, don't, if, we don't know the cost. I, I met, right. I wouldn't be surprised the town could get it done for a lot. No, I agree. Yeah, I'm, that's the yeah. upper limit. Yeah, you, you so let, know, let's I, not throw that. Hell, just, I, I, I'll go do it for a hundred. <laughs> you know exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's actually let's not let's not surface that number uh, because it could actually throw up an early impediment. The, really, the opportunity here is is that they're building. Let's do it. And um, and I, I even though David didn't address that in his reply, he knows what we're talking about. Yeah, um, we just need to you know, communicate our, okay. the, the urgency here. I think it certainly makes sense to at least get together a cost estimate of what such a project looks like, especially since I think that, you know, on quite a number of these, you know, 52 sections that we've identified fall into this, this particular category. Um, and the, it's clearly an area that's never going to never going to be done. And you know, while I'm sure that you know you can see there's telephone and cable util underground utility services that are also there. This is this is this is the one of the white spaces that that exists. And I think we need to at least explore whether or not there's a programmatic way to do it. This strikes me as good coordination amongst town departments that we should be promoting. Okay, good. So um, consensus on that is I will, uh, I will ask for some participation in a discussion about how this opportunity might be considered. Is that yeah, and I, I would just, I, and I, not that I know that this is um, a good idea or, or anything, but just also, you know, it's possible that they've already got this on their, on the, that they, they don't need a huge push from us in order to jump on this opportunity. So there may be an instance where a lighter touch could actually be, um, yeah. okay, you just got to feel it out and see how it is. I mean, you, it, you're dealing with personalities and and you know what I mean, attitudes and, and whatever, so. Well, you know, and to the, to the point about let's, you know, let's say hypothetically, there's a number and of, you know, of, an, of opportunities every year that come up. And I think it's, you know, it could be useful to do something like try to understand how much road gets reconstructed every year, assume that there's going to be a certain number of these that come up and say, if there was similar to the underground fund, a, a fiber completion fund that was set up maybe, you know, with money from the ARPA grant that was to, you know, that seeded it with, you know, for the sake of argument, a few hundred thousand dollars, and then the idea was to replenish it as projects were done and built. And so opportunistically, those, those areas that, that are getting reconstructed anyway, get fiber, it would be, I think it'd be a much more satisfactory answer to residents to say, hey, when your street gets rebuilt, if there's money in the fiber fund, you're, the fiber is gonna get installed in there too. Sure. I wouldn't necessarily connect it to a, a fund. Um, the, the, the fund was established, the undergrounding fund was established by town meeting. It's a, you know, it's a, um, what do they call it? A, a restricted fund. Yeah. It defines a, yeah, a we're not talking minimum something. bound on that, that they need to do a certain amount of, anyway, no, I don't. I think there, we can, more we flexibility can't. may be actually advantageous. Yeah, I don't think we can. Well, we certainly can't use the existing undergrounding fund. That that's obvious, right? That's Mark. No, right. That's I David's agree. position. Yeah, I agree. And, I agree and, with that. Yeah. So, right. what what the nature of that fund is could be something as informal as 
payment in lieu of taxes that you know one department graciously writes a check to the town in lieu of taxes or broadband does that relative to this fund or you know or maybe just allocates it internally you know one of the things that they could do is um instead of paying down the debt faster they take this a certain amount of money and put it into a fund that's i you know in their in their current mm -hmm. um, accounts and use it for this purpose and um the rate at which they pay down the fund is you know that this is all part of the recommendation about how to pay for it not the but I think I think that what comes out of this is a recommendation that first of all, which Mark hit on, which is there are the or all of you, a number of you have hit on it, which is there are these opportunities when road the roads program does dig up a street, that is a prime opportunity to put the conduit in. That's that's a that's a part of our report that says what needs to be done. The second part that is how are we going to pay for it? Here's an idea that's correlated to that, which is a yeah. sort of conduit fund. That belongs in the second part of a report we can forward reference it but that's the way i would structure it it's like keep that model of yeah. what's this nature and the scope here's the ways to solve it here's what it will cost and how we can pay for it yeah uh though i i think that they don't necessarily need us to tell them how to how to sort out um some of those details um i think that if we if if the report said that you don't want to that you want to be aware of these opportunities and act on them where you can. Um, now, I, that would, that would be I, guess I, I guess I kind of disagree, at least from a report level. Maybe it's stating the obvious, but. Yeah, and I, you know, honestly, if we put something down and we did it wrong, it wouldn't derail the project. It just wouldn't probably matter that much. It, it's not it's our job to sort this out. All this we is can, a recommendation. Some hints. Yeah. 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 Say, you know, based on what we, you know, are thinking about it deeply, smart people thinking about it deeply. This is our recommendation. Yeah. Please to listen. Yeah. I mean, I, right. is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to these ideas. I really, I, I'm, I'm, I am. I just, I'm just trying to um, not micromanage some yeah. of the, the stuff, and that, that's all. It's, it's yeah. not, a, not a big deal. The mechanism of the you know, road repairs is, is also funded through what they call the road repair revolving fund, which is which is where this whole program comes out, comes out of it. And it was interesting, you know, I happen to get this letter because so there's an arrival in my house. Um, there, I got this letter as a result of the fact that, you know, the street that I live on happens to be scheduled for something they call asphalt rubber treatment, which is a lesser form of refurbishment as part of this year's program as well. And so I that caused me to go back and look at the Public Works Commission and try and understand that because I didn't know what it was. And what, what the Public Works Commission is dealing with is the fact that apparently what they, their metric, which is called pavement condition index is declining in Concord. And we are behind the eight ball in effect on road reconstruction activities. So what we can anticipate is that, you know, they're, they're looking at several ways to catch up. One of them is some different forms of treatment, which are less than full depth reconstruction, which is the most expensive thing they do. Um, to help beef up the pavement condition and also, um, you know, their planning, but they could, we could see something like the Public Works Commission coming forward with a, you know, a special, you know, borrowing or something in order to get at a lot of roads. And that could exacerbate this problem of, hey, we've got all these newly paved roads that don't have any fiber under them. And I think that for that reason alone, it's, it's useful for us to say, um, let's make sure that there's, there's some thinking going on about how to make sure that we're not writing this, these, these places off essentially forever. Um, because I think that would yeah. be, um, because you know, the, these are customers right in the, in the heart of town who, you know, I think have, have a right to have a choice with, with their service and, and have the option of fiber. Yeah. Uh, might not be it's, the most needy if you're, you know, if you're looking at, at that, but it's still, 
um, if the goal is to, to do, do it, there has to be a plan to make it happen that it's cost effective. This, this could be kind of um, lumpy, so to speak, in that you could have a year where none of the renovation project roads are actually um, need new fiber. Right. And you could also have a, 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 an instance where all of a sudden there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of pavement, a lot of fiber, and it'd be much more expensive. It's, it's kind of um, could be uh, random. Then that, that's where the idea of a smoothing function would be helpful. Yeah, and having some kind of fund where you can, like, I know that um, there were funds set aside for kind of a while to deal with Cambridge Turnpike. I think it still needed some, you know, still needed some special borrowing, but that's an example of, you know, a relatively expensive re road to reconstruct. It has almost no resonances on it given its length, but that would be an example of where you know, funds had to be sort of set aside for a little while in order to be able to do that whole project. Um, that, that turns out to be, in, uh, and fiber was at least, it's either, it was either already there or was put in at the time. So that, that's an example of it working. So I think that, you know, my, my sense of the response was, you know, from the public works side, they seem to be very open to it. I think that the question is, you know, let, let's make sure that, that on the, on the broadband side, on the fiber side, they're they're actually looking for this as well. So that was why I raised that. Um, thank you for your input on it. Anybody else have anything else they want to say on that score? I think I heard that there's a hundred miles of street in Concord. About that, I think 110 or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the in that report that I had pulled up before. If you total the footage of those areas that I was looking at, it that that grand total was eighty one thousand and one feet. So whatever that is in miles. Fifteen miles. I actually just ran that number today. Okay. Oh really? Thirteen miles. Fifteen. Fifteen. One five. Yeah. Those those are the miles that are not served in that table. Well, yeah, and remember, I I ruled out open spaces and you know areas that appear to you know not have anything meaningful on them. But that's the, these are you know parcels that were passed, and and I do think that the majority of them are are in these kind of cul-de-sac areas, or in some cases, I, I will say that you know I just running my eye down, you know, 6,900 feet, you know, more, better than a mile, 1.2 miles of Virginia Road. It looks like, you know, actually there's several sections of Virginia Road is pretty substantial. About 10% of that is all on Virginia Road. Wow. Um, by the way, I was going to mention uh, just a, a quick comment to Gordon's comment about lumpiness and the demand. <laughs> It's it's a perfectly fine technical term. Um, I actually think it wouldn't be as lumpy because there's a good chance that all all these underground roads that have underground utilities were probably done in the you know after some date in the 50s or 60s, and generally don't have um, underground conduit. Right? Oh, never mind. Forget it. Brain brain. Uh, Brain smart. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's actually it's I, to to but well, I think an example of what where your line of thinking might be um, uh, similar to mine is is that a hundred miles. How how long does a road last? Let's say it's twenty miles. Then we'd need to do they would they you know you have five you know twenty to hundred divided by twenty is five that kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's a different conversation, and I think. The truth of the matter is it has a lot to do with what the underlying stability of the earth is because a, a road that can be cracks filled to avoid the ice freezing, breaking up the road can last a very long time. Mm -hmm. Whereas other places where there's not very stability underneath, more cracks appear. And that's what breaks these roads apart is the cracks appear, water gets in there, it freezes, a car or a truck goes over and it breaks the road apart. I saw a parking lot destroyed in a, one season practically because they didn't seal it. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I I think that it's I I guess what I was going to say is there there are I think there are a number of reasons for reconstructing roads, but I think that it does make sense to to it's consistent with where we've said we wanted to go, which is programmatic solutions and and systematic approach to this to say, okay, here's something that happens every year. Um, and it seems to plug into the, the, the mission here. So let's let's at least define how the question is going to get asked and answered. And I, I will say that I am interested in the in the fund idea because I think once you have a fund sitting there like the you know like the undergrounding fund or the CARES fund or the road revolving repair fund, it has a tendency to draw some attention. Hey, there's money building up on that. When are we going to spend it? Um, for for the purpose, and it's also consistent with the notion that there's some, you know, acceptable level of of, of focus so that that comes with that 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 means that eventually progress is made. So I, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought that that was a good one for us to, and again, you know, for anybody who's ever watching this. We're, we're talking about this because somebody contacted our committee and asked a question about this. And, and that's really appreciated. Yep. Okay. Um, we have about 15 minutes left and those were the main, let, let me, I, I know I had some, some notes. Let me just make sure I, I got there. Uh, yeah, I think we got, we got caught up with everything that I had. So does anybody have anything they want to say about um, report generation or progress they might have made talking about their section that they want to share with the committee or anything of that nature that, that, to deal with today? Are you interested in reports of lack of progress? If there's that. So let me, let's let's, let's let, let me ask let me ask the question this way: When is our current outlook target for having the com component sections to the point where other folks can review them? Well, Gordon was there when I talked to the select board, and I made a made a commitment on behalf of our task force that we would try to we would publish our report by the time town meeting happens, which is which is actually May 1st, with the idea being that now that they've extended our appointments out through the end of the fiscal year, June 30th, I would ideally like to see us say what we're going to say and begin discussing that with relevant boards and committees. You know, we think the light board should should be watching these things. We think the select board might want to look at those things. We think the finance committee might have that and sort of publish something and give ourselves some time while we're still acting as a task force to go and, and socialize those findings and, and give people an opportunity to ask us questions. So um, if we took that, you know, May 1st and recognize that, you know, essentially almost tomorrow is February 1st, um, that gives us March and April to February, March and April to really, I think, solidify some of these ideas and, and begin to get them on paper. So I would like to think we're working on um, working on some of those definitions on a weekly basis from here, um, even if we also insert topics like the one we just had, which I, I think are clarifying for us, actually. Yeah. Well, so let me ask a question another way. Um, would it be appropriate that we're done with our report, at least in draft form, so that we can begin to have those committee conversations as of the end of March? Is that too late, giving us a like, month? I'd like to see. I think I'd like to target. Let's try to get a draft done by March 1st and okay. then a revised version by April 1st and then say, OK, this is what we're thinking. How about that? That sounds good. So that puts us kind of so we we have more or less four meetings I think for February 
So maybe we do one section per meeting the next four weeks and call that addressing the draft. Well, wait a minute. So there's the writing it and then the reviewing of it. So uh, just to understand clearly, mm -hmm. if we had the first draft March 1st, that's a two days to assemble it. And then we start reviewing it March 1st. So you want to review the sections before and do the assembly and March 1st have the assembled version. Um, I'd like to think that we could assemble a first, you know, a first cut that we would want to look at by March 1st. And then take a, you know, understand what revisions they do and also have a discussion about who needs to, you know, look at it in more detail. Okay. And would we be reviewing those sections before the assemblage or only at that time? I'm thinking we should look at, you know, we should try to look at some of the sections as kind of as they're being built, at least in outline form so that we're kind of understanding where we're going, especially if we think there are choices to be made about how, what some, a particular section says. Yeah, it would be um, helpful. I started drafting a section um, to have all the minutes in one place. So Mark, I don't mean to yeah. put pressure on you, but I was trying to like, just go through my notes and they're kind of messy. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know, that's, cause I, I think I was, you know, we should like review the minutes as we're drafting so that we make sure that we catch everything that we've talked about. That makes sense. So I'm going to make sure that we get is, I'm focusing over the next week on really posting. It's one of the reasons why I haven't written a lot this week is because I wanted to do that. And um, a couple of things that I've discovered, which are you know a little disturbing is, not every one of our meetings, even though they're, everyone is recorded, um, is being posted to YouTube. So that's, that, that makes you know, filling in the gaps a little bit more difficult. Um, I've noticed in particular that nothing from since December 23rd, I think, is, has come up. So I'll approach um, Miniman Media and ask them where they're doing it. There is the playlist um, and it, so, you know, to the point that we've discussed earlier about minutes, minutes are important because we can't count on these videos, um, recordings ever really being there. Um, not to mention the fact that it takes a long time to go through one of them. Um, so yes, and yes. And um, what I can do if, if it's helpful is I can distribute the final copies. You know, there is a link on our page to what's been posted, but as, as we finalize minutes, we can distribute them to everybody so that people can keep their own folder. I've created a folder that I keep with, with every minute in its own sub meeting in its own subfolder. And so I'm keeping the agendas and the docs in that way, but, and I'm happy to share anything specific with someone. Yeah, I, okay. I think but, Mark, I suspect you have all the minutes uh, in your hot hands. So that would be something you could do. I know the shared drive model doesn't, has public meeting issues. So it, I, I'd be okay. And Gail, I'm wondering if this would work for you is if he took the PDF of every minutes, put them all in a separate directory and then mailed us, all of us, all the minutes from that directory so that we would just, in one email, we would have all the minutes that, that exist. And would, it, would you prefer to have them in Word versus PDF, Gail? Oh, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Like I can okay. word search either one. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it, it'll be my goal to make sure that we, that everything I can possibly post is posted. And, and if you were the clerk on a meeting where I feel like there's some, something that's not completed, you'll be hearing from me this week. <laughs> <laughs> So that, I think I got stuck on a couple of, of the early meetings and, and so that, but I think that um, I'm at a stage where there'll be several more probably get, I think that, I think I can get the, just about everything done by, by next Thursday. So that they're at least out on the website for people that wanna do it. And if, if it's helpful for me to, to also send a note with them all in there, I can do that or, or a link to that. I'm happy to work off the town website. I guess it's the lawyer in me likes to go with like the official source. So yeah, um, yeah. 
but that's but, maybe that's just me. Yeah. I don't have a strong opinion about. And to that end, to to make it clear, when we when we finish finalizing our minutes on it, you know when we voted to approve, whoever is the clerk who's working on those minutes needs to save that approved edit and send it back to me so that I can add any documents to it and put it in PDF file and get it posted. So that's that's the the you know appendix piece of work that that we that we're behind on even though I have um, documents that we've we've approved so I just need to make sure that those are finalized yeah um, Mark I'm gonna do one incremental since I'm kind of doing the minutes now I'm going to do one more thing just so just to communicate about this I'll, I'll use the format where I have the minutes the minutes with the TC at the end for the review when when we go through that actual review, and I do that exercise and make those changes, I'll change it to the word final at the end and then yeah. email them to you. And that way you can look and know that they're final. Yeah, and that's what I've been doing is I've been changing, you know, I've been absorbing the columns, changing it to final, saving it as a PDF and then adding PDFs of whatever else okay. you need to get in there at the end, so resaving that and then sending it all to the clerk so that they only have to post one file for each minute. So those should be up to date. I think it we're um, we're working on October at the moment. So there's a few more minute meetings to do. But like I said, everything's been approved, and I've been saving it all along. I just have to finalize that piece. Yeah, and I think just parenthetically, Mark, I think I gave you the last one that we needed on October. Great. Yeah, it's okay. in your email. I, yeah, a day or two ago, I gave it to you. Yeah. So that should be that. Okay, so next week we'll um, we'll start working on on kind of the problem statement, and we'll start uh, we'll have some further discussion about how to approach the road program. So I'll uh, send you guys copies of what of the communications that I have with with town staff about that. Um, do you would you guys prefer it? Go ahead, Gordon. No, I don't want to change the subject. Oh, I was just going to ask you, would you prefer it if I if I go ahead and meet with town staff on our behalf and try and sort of, you know, or would you prefer it if I invited them to come here and talk about how they might do that? I'm kind of I, inclined towards the former. I, I think I'm okay with either because, um, you know, first of all, I, I can imagine that the town staff look at the videos if they're available but asking yeah. them to, to work late, I don't, you know, to, to Gordon's point, you know, I don't, I'm not sure we, it would be doing such a great service to ask them to start trying to attend this meeting. And, you know, yeah. we're doing it because we're volunteering. They, they might not feel so good about it. So, yeah, I mean, you could ask them if they, you know, what works best for them to, you know, to discuss this concept, you know, this idea that, that has come up. And we, we did already put in a request for them to help us uh, sort out what the missing streets are, what, what, what the story is between, behind each of those. And they, yeah. they owe, us, owe us some data. So, um, okay. I'll, I was going to ask, I, I assume you haven't heard anything back from that. So it's probably time to reiterate that request. Yeah. Um, I did ask them about whether or not there's a risk that if we increase the subscribers so much that eventually it would cause us to have to start paying into the same fund that Comcast pays into. And the answer is it's actually already happened. And it's a payment that the broadband enterprise makes called a payment in lieu of franchise. Yep, yeah, I've noticed that in the reports that I've gotten. Yeah, to be to be clear though, I don't think there's anything that's requiring us to make that payment. Mm -hmm. That that's uh, the it's I I understand well. So in this year's budget, and this is why I think um, it's important for us to to 
attend the enterprise budget hearing and, and, and be prepared with some questions. The payment in lieu of franchise, which I believe was in the amount of $18,000 for 2021, was transferred from the broadband business to support the Miniman Media Network operations, which is what the Comcast franchise payments also do, which is the public access, public educational and government access station. And so it's sensible, but Comcast does that based on their, as we were, as Carlin was talking about earlier, based on their cable TV subscriptions, not based on their internet yeah. subscriptions. Yeah. And so we've kind of made a leap here that says that Concord Light Broadband is somehow cannibalizing cable and, and there's a need to support the, this thing, which is exactly how these recordings are being presented. But in my view, I don't recall, and Gordon, you were on the light board, I'm not sure that there was a lot of substantive discussion about you know, why, why that particular burden and not some other you know, deserving element it was just kind of said oh we put this in the budget so that we could do this yeah all of those pilots are like that yeah. like any one of the solar arrays in town generates uh basically property tax it's a pilot mm -hmm. um and the size of that is um negotiated yeah and it's probably i think you can fair to say that it's negotiated privately yeah and i would um you know from my time serving on the town finance committee um, the previous finance director, Tony Lagalvo, used to remind us that payment in lieu of taxes, which is what the light plant does, um, is a not terribly tax efficient way to collect general fund revenue because to the electric utility user, that's just part of their electric bill, which is not deductible. And so, of course, at that time, property taxes were fully deductible. And now I think that there's a lot of people who only get a very limited tax benefit for their property taxes at all. But, you know, it was pointed out that to the extent that you could deduct your property tax and not deduct your from electric bill, it'd be, you know, all of things being equal, it'd be better to pay the general fund in, in the light bill. And the same logic would apply to a broadband bill. The other thing I wanted to just point out is, is that um, since we last met, uh, Verizon's rolled out 5G in town and mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm getting uh, like a hundred Mbps, mm -hmm. um, usually less than that. Um, so the reason why I bring that to this committee is, is that I consider that to be a strategic uh, threat. Mm -hmm. It is a strategic threat. I will also mention that that 100 megabits, even if you run a bandwidth test, in fact, it's shared amongst quite a number of endpoints. That's the mm -hmm. same phenomena that happens with Wi-Fi base stations. Oh, yes, I've got a gigabit Wi-Fi base station. That's very different than having a gigabit come into a particular endpoint. Mm -hmm. That that five 5G bandwidth, whatever the 100 megabits you're getting now, that may be shared with 50, 100, 200 people that have 5G phones that are, that may be. There you go. So that would explain I, I the best numbers I've gotten around the day. Yeah, yeah. Three in the morning, you're going to get great numbers. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It, the other thing but but you can't, out. you can't all watch TV uh, during a snowstorm, uh, you know, in the, in the evening because that not going to happen, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but in times when, when Concord has had wide, power outages, the cell phone um, bandwidth disappears. Yeah. The other thing that's that's of concern, of course, is that, you know, there's been a lot of recent news about 5G interference with um, aircraft operations and a considerable percentage of, of the town of Concord is actually within the, you know, radar operations area of um, Hanscom Air Force Base. I'm, I'm, I'm three and a half miles from the approach end of one of the Hanscom runways. Right. And yeah. So yeah. That, that actually leads to 
some restrictions on on what can in fact even your wi-fi router if it's a 5g router may avoid certain channels because of known um, interference with with um, radar operations so there's you know good reason to be concerned about whether or not there might be whole sections of the town for which you know 5g may or may not ever get there unless they solve some of the problems such but as that, virginia road which is adjacent to hanscom yeah where where yeah. we don't have a lot of fiber well, Verizon has a coverage map, and it doesn't look to me like as if this new layer, I think band C or whatever, um, is actually solving the relative uh, scarcity of bandwidth in uh, certain parts of town. I know I was sitting in, I think, Crosby's parking lot the other day and couldn't get a basic web page to yeah. load on my phone. Yeah. Okay, okay, I think we've digressed. But, and I see that it is eight. So um, I'll take public comments um, if there are any. Hearing none. Um, I think we could take a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Thank you, Gail. Anybody want to second that? I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> okay. Good, and so we'll see you back here next Thursday. Got to take a roll call. Oh, Lois, did you want to say something? Just saying goodbye? Thank you for being here, Lois. Okay. It's interesting. All right, we appreciate your attending. Okay, and um, who seconded, Gordon? Yep. Okay, um, we'll take a vote. Uh, Scott? Aye. Uh, Gail? Aye. Gordon? Aye. And myself, aye. Happy snowstorm. Thank you. Bye, Bye now. Storm.